Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this morning. Lord, I thank you for all these wonderful people, Lord God, who showed up to hear from you. Lord, we, we thank you for testimonies. Lord, that, that say you didn't, you didn't leave us where you found us. Lord, that you took a, a mess and you made a message out of it. Lord, you took us and drew us out of deep waters and put us as to be a city on a hill. Lord, I just, I just thank you for this time together, Lord. I, I thank you for these people that your fingerprints are all over, Lord God, and it just screams of your love. Lord, I, I just pray that you'll do an amazing work in us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, so this week, I, I, I want to focus on the, the, you know, the next part of reset, which would be the rebuild. Uh, and I've got, a, I've got a group that helped me this morning as I got here early. Is, are any of my rock uh, droppers crew, are they in here? You guys, the, the gear kids, we had the, the McCollums. And any of those? I want to give them a big shout out. I told them I would, man. They, they helped me this morning. So uh, I want us to look forward in faith this year. I, I want us to look forward in, into going after what God has for us. Like you saw with Rodney, and, and, and you know, bitterness and, and disappointment and destruction could leave us in a place where we don't get to realize the dream that God's got for us. Uh, so we don't re want to repeat the same misery of last year. There's been a lot of tough times for a lot of people here the last 12, the last six months, three months, six months, 12 months, 18, 24 months, five years, 10 years. For some of the people in this room, you guys have had some very traumatic things go on over the last few months, few years, and we don't want to make that our life cry. We don't want everything in the future to be built off of those tragedies. So what do we do about going forward? You know, we don't want to repeat or relive the misery of the past. So I ask you this morning... What dream has the Lord been giving you? What dreams has the Lord been speaking to you? It's really, it's really, it's not coincidental, it's, it's the Lord's timing uh, that the last time I preached to you guys, we were talking about our well, that we, we, we had been digging a well and, and didn't know if we were going to get water, and I forgot to even tell you we got water. You know, <laughs> back that day I had a bunch of people tell me, hey, did y'all get water? Yeah, we got water. So, so. We were praying about it, and, and it was the beginning of the dream. And I tell you, I stand here today after we spent our second night in our house that is the well supplies water for is the culmination of a dream, of, of what God has done. And, and there's a lot of people in this room that have helped us to see these dreams and to, and to, to add their expertise to this dream and to see it come about. That's what the body of Christ does spiritually, and that's what your brothers and sisters do for you, even with dreams of the, the temporary, like a house. But uh, I want to look in, look in our Bibles this morning. In Nehemiah chapter 1, we're going to look at the rebuild. So, it says, these are the memoirs of Nehemiah. It says, in late autumn in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I was in the fortress of Susa. One of my brothers came to visit me with some other men who had just arrived from Judah. I asked them about the Jews who had returned there from captivity and about how things were going in Jerusalem. They said to me, things are not going well for those who return to the province of Judah. They're in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down, and the gates have been destroyed by fire. When I heard this, I sat down and I wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. Then I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of unfailing love with those who love him and obey his commands, listen to my prayer. Look down and see me praying night and day for your people Israel. I confess that we have sinned against you. Yes, even my own family and I have sinned. We have sinned terribly by not obeying the commands, decrees, and regulations that you have gave us through your servant Moses. Please remember what you told your servant Moses. 
If you are unfaithful to me, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands and live by them, then even if you are exiled to the ends of the earth, I will bring you back to the place I have chosen for my name to be honored. The people you rescued by your great power and strong hand are your servants. O oh Lord, please hear my prayer. Listen to the prayers of those of us who delight in honoring you. Please grant me success today by making the king favorable to me. Put it into his heart to be kind to me. In those days, I was the king's cupbearer. So we see in scripture here, Nehemiah, he is saddened. He is, he is personally repentant of what's happened to this great city. And you know, what to do in a season of loss? What does it look like? What does a prayer look like in a season of loss? You know, just like we saw in Rodney's testimony, he went through a season of devastating loss. And then we hear a whisper from the Lord that says, come, let's dream. Let's see, what, let's see what's out in front and let's rebuild from what's been torn down. And the Lord will plant a seed in us, a dream of restoration. Not just to be circling the spot of the burned and scorched earth of the past, but a dream of rebuilding and restoration. And it's, it's amazing to get to, and, to, and to be in that bus that we were in and get to experience and see what God was doing then and why we broke down. Why did we need to be still? Why did we need to hear from him? We were just frustrated that we broke down. But there was a reason why we broke down. So don't always discount what God's doing with you. You may think you look terrible, that your situation looks terrible, you, that things couldn't be worse for you. And you cry out to God and say, this is so terrible, God, I, I've never been worse. And you're praying to him every day and you're fasting like Nehemiah. And he says, man, I've never seen you look better. I've never seen you look better than you do now. And we see it. We get to live it out on screen with our brother that you get to, to talk to every day and be encouraged by is he's telling you about where he was in the valley and how God took his hand and took him up on the hill. But we must first understand that Satan would want nothing more than for you to be better than to be better. He didn't want to just see us stumble. He wants to see us fall. I, I like to think of it this way. You know, he gets up every morning and meets with his henchmen to try to pull through a, the opposite of a Jeremiah 29 11 for you. He wants to see if he can get you to buy into his plan of seeing you fall. But I don't know if you guys realize this, but defeat and victory work off very much the same principle. They work off the principle of momentum. You know, usually when one bad thing happens in our life, we usually can go find another one. And then we'll string together one more. And we start kind of looking at the glass as half empty or in the sense of, I, I, and I drank out of it this morning, uh, is we either... Or half empty or we've got the Tigger cup. The wonderful thing about Tigger. Or the Eeyore. But whatever it is, whether it's half full or half empty, we have to leave room for God. Whatever season that you're coming out of, you have to leave room for the Lord. What we see in the story of Nehemiah is a powerful example of how God will equip the call instead of calling the equip. We always want to be you know, the right person for the right job, and is, is that going to suit me? Well, if we read in Scripture what Nehemiah was, he was a eunuch. And, and I was talking to Max in Sunday school this morning about what a eunuch is. And if we had a eunuch 101 as one of our Wednesday night classes, I can tell you how many guys we'd see up in there. It'd be a big zero. It's a forced castration. In a more glorified term, it would be what you do when you take your dog that is too rambunctious and too uh, overactive to Philip Smith for him to neuter your dog. I want my dog to be less uh, on the sofa and a little more mindful. So that's what they did and made eunuchs so that they would be not as testosterone driven. They would be more gentle. 
And we see that's what, that's what Nehemiah was. He wasn't, he wasn't equipped to do what God was about to plant in him. He was a cupbearer to a king. Put him in close proximity and he, hold, he held his cup. Hello, king. Hello today. But he wasn't a threat to the king. God used what Satan had used to defeat Nehemiah, God used to propel Nehemiah. What, ne what Nehemiah didn't think he had, God used for good. Amen? Amen. Romans 8, 28. What Satan intends for bad, God will use for good. That's what we see playing out in Nehemiah's life. Le Nehemiah didn't have a legacy. He didn't have a family. Sort of the same kind of thing that Rodney didn't think he was going to have. But Nehemiah was a builder. So Nehemiah was part of a group of exiles who had left Jerusalem with just about the skin on their back and maybe a few clothes, and they were exiles. Through defeat, God's people, and their, in, in, through defeat and disobedience, God's people had been exiled to the ends of the earth. They'd been scattered. And we see a story here that Nehemiah gets a report from some of his, from of his boys from back in the neighborhood Come and he says, well, how, how's everything in Judah? How's it in Jerusalem? He, they say, it's terrible. The, 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 the walls are over and the gates are burned. And everybody's in, everything's in disrepair and everybody's depressed. There's no life in the city. The city is in ruins. It's been destroyed. Scripture tells us that Nehemiah's response to this news was that he sat down and he wept. And he mourned. And it didn't say he did it for five minutes. Let me throw one up, Lord. I'm saddened by that. It says he did it for several days. It said that wasn't enough. It said he also fasted. It said he mourned and he fasted and he prayed and he cried out to God. I'm going to tell you something. If you want to fuel a dream with God, cry out to him and fast and pray. Don't leave out the fasting because that hurts. That's obedience, and God blesses that. See, there were a whole bunch of people that were upset about this. All the people that had been run out of this wonderful city, God's chosen people a favor that his hand had been over for so long, they were upset about it. They were jacked up about it. But there wasn't that many that were personally repentant about it. See, Nehemiah didn't look around pointing fingers at who was to blame. He cried out in his prayer. He said, God, for me and my family, we have sinned against you. And we, and we understand why this is the way it is. But please forgive me. Please restore what has been broken. Nehemiah started asking for forgiveness for himself and for his father's house. Nehemiah started asking God to not only forgive his sin that he participated in, but he asked for sin, forgiveness of sin for generational sin. He wanted a generational forgiveness. And, and I'm going to tell you, uh, many of you may not believe in generational sin, but many of you are affected by it. And that's a whole other sermon for a whole other day. But it is also a self-defeating, self-satisfying uh, prophecy. But Nehemiah... He got down on his face and he asked God to forgive him and to forgive his family. Nehemiah knew from God's word that God had promised to scatter the Jews among the nations for their disobedience. He knew that. He understood that. He recognized that in his prayer. But he also, and there's a but in there, but he also remembered that God had promised to gather the exiles back from the farthest parts of the globe if if they would return to God and his commandments. What we are witnessing is Nehemiah is praying a dream that is way above his pay grade. Nehemiah is asking God to use him in a way that, he, for he is not equipped. He's not, he's not been trained in this. He doesn't have the temperament nor the respect to, to pull this off. But he's asking God to show him favor. Nehemiah was believed to be a eunuch. 
but God believed him to be so much more. Just when anyone else would have had Nehemiah thought that Nehemiah had nothing to live for, God shows up and plants a dream in Nehemiah bigger than Nehemiah. If your dreams are not bigger than you, than something you can pull off on your own, you need to dream bigger dreams. If you can't do it without God, then it's not really a dream. Amen? Spiritually. So God had given Nehemiah favor in his humble position. I want to pause again and ask you, how do you dream? How do you dream? So if you ask me about how we dreamed about this house, that we, this, this, this awesome thing that we've seen come to fruition over the last couple of days, um, it's very detailed. It, it's, it's, you know, we want a light switch here. We want the stairs here. We want the landscaping right here. And, and my brother Adam has gone through that with us and, and helped us to get all those things. Because God revealed those things in color to us as, as we prayed about it. And we were, you know, we'd write it down. And, and that was a, that's a temporary dream. Somebody else will own this house one day after we're gone. You know, it's, uh, it's just here for a little while. What about the, the dreams for the kingdom stuff? What about, what about covenant and kingdom dreams? What about dreams that are spiritual? So if I ask you about what God's saying to you, I used to have a brother that would, Michael Miller would ask me, he said, what's the Lord speaking to you? What's the Lord saying to you? There's, there's daddy back here. What's the Lord saying to you? Man, he'd catch me sideways. I didn't know. What's the answer? It's a tough question. What's the Lord saying to you? Well, usually we'll give some kind of vague answer. Ah, I just want to be in his will. I'm just wait, I'm waiting on the Lord. Waiting on the Lord. That's in the Bible. Wait no Lord. I just want to be in his will. I want to go where he goes, do what he does. And that's, that's some of the, the vague verbalizations we give for spiritual dreams. That's not what we see with Nehemiah. And I want to ask you, how do you dream? How do you dream? Do you dream in color? Because, see, we see Nehemiah pulls off a colorful dream. You, you just you, you didn't see Nehemiah say back to God, I'm just I'm praying about it. I'm praying about it, Lord. I'm praying about this this devastation we see on this city and these people that are your chosen people. I, I'm, I'm just gonna pray about it. See, if we pray vague prayers what kind of answers do you think we'll get? Vague. We'll get vague answers. If we pray vague prayers and we're just going to throw up a, a shout out about it, well, you're going to get vague answers. You're going to get black and white answers. What would happen if we started praying dreams in color and we started asking God to color our dreams in a forward motion? Do you know why we dream in black and white? Any idea why we do that? And we don't dream in the temporary in black and white. If I ask you what kind of, I'm going to give you a, a, a truck. You just want a brand new truck. You're going to, one of the questions going to be, what, what color is it? Is it a crew cab? Four wheel drive? You're going to start dreaming in color. When you, when you register for Publishers Clearinghouse, you, you've already started spending the money. <laughs> if we get that, we're going to the Bahamas. I'm going to wear that little one piece. So, you know why we, we dream in black and white? Because it doesn't require much effort. It doesn't cost us anything. I'm talking about the end of the limb prayer. Prayer for healing. Get on the end of the limb. You know, we, we've been, like, in, in some of the things we've done for Sons of Thunder and pray for people, we looked in Scripture, and what Jesus did is Jesus would say, what do you want me to do for you? When they came to him, and they'd be blind or a leper. And he, he said, what do you want me to do for you? He'd say, well, I want to be healed. I want to see. And he'd ask, do you believe I can do it? And they could say, yes. And then he would. 
What we never see in Scripture is where somebody came to him that was in desperate need of healing. And they said, I just, I just want, I want peace. I, just, I want everything. I just want everybody to be okay. I just want everything to be okay. See, that's a vague prayer. Ask for healing. What would happen if you needed healing and you asked God to heal you? Well, the, the answer to that is there's, there's no plan B. If, if, we, if we go all in with God, then we don't, we don't need to give God a safe spot to land. Amen? God doesn't need a plan B. He doesn't need your plan B. Either you're all in or you're not. But God won't do anything with vague prayers. He'll give you vague answers. And that's what we've been as, as Christians, as a church, is we've been semi-victorious. You know, we left Egypt as being enslaved in Egypt, but we didn't make it to the promised land. You know, it's safe. Black and white prayers are safe. There's no danger in them. But I want to tell you, I want to quote King David here. Man that was jacked up. He had all kinds of baggage. But you know what God said about David? He said he's got a heart like mine. And he said, how can I bring to God something that costs me nothing? See, if it costs me nothing, how can I bring that to the Lord? How can I present my prayer to the Lord if it costs me nothing? See, Nehemiah, he came in and he prayed a bold prayer. He prayed and asked, he asked King Artaxerxes. He basically went in his office, knocked on the door and said, Hey, hey boss, I'm going to need a lot of time off and I'm going to need your credit card. <laughs> he said, man, that sounds good. That sounds good, Nehemiah. Why don't you gas up the company truck and take a crew of guys with you? That's the answer because God had already gone before him in his prayer and prepared, and prepared the king to do what he was going to use him to do. He was already out in front of him. He wasn't pay, praying in reverse. He wasn't praying based on the rearview mirror of the wreck he had had as an exile in the eunuch. He didn't go in there. You don't see him, oh, oh, this is what's happened to me. He's praying and says, I want to go and rebuild. I want to go investigate. And, and I want you to help me. And God joined in there. We see God's favor on that. See, but what fueled the effectiveness of Nehemiah's prayer was that he was personally repentant of his involvement in it. That he had equity in the burned out ground. See, Nehemiah realized that he and his family and the sin that they had participated in, whether, ever, whether anybody else in that city knew, Nehemiah knew. He knew, his, he knew his thoughts. He knew what he had thought. He knew his mind. He knew what he'd been up to. And he said, God, please forgive me. Please forgive me. See, God will get about that. That will fuel a dream. That will turn a black and white dream into a colored dream when we become personally repentant for breaking God's heart. To just be sorry isn't enough. There were a lot of people there that were sorry. But it seemed to be that Nehemiah was the only one that asked for forgiveness. To acknowledge our disobedience and sin before a holy God, it will fertilize the dreams of tomorrow. It will fertilize the dreams that God's planning in you. Nehemiah came up against some, some naysayers. It just didn't go easy, and you shouldn't expect that your dreams would go easy. He, he came up against some naysayers uh, and some troublemakers, and it'll happen anytime that, that God plants a dream in you. That it's going to be anything that's bigger than you, you're going to have naysayers and you're going to have doubters. But Nehemiah didn't serve them, he served God. And what Nehemiah focused on is exactly what we need to focus on to see dreams come back alive in our life is to rebuild the walls and to rebuild the gates. See, that was, that was a symptom of a problem of sin, is the walls had fallen and the gates had been burned. There is no city or there's no family, listen to me, there's no city and there's no family that can survive without the protection of the walls and the gates of the Lord. This is where Nehemiah focused his efforts, on rebuilding the walls and the gates. Walls are designed in nature to keep things out. 
They're designed to protect those who reside within those walls. And a gate is designed to create an opening within the structure that allows freedom. The gate is meant for freedom. The law of God are the walls that are surround us. The law that God gives us, the commandments are, the, are what surround us, protect us. Now I'm going to read something. John 10, 9. In your Bible, John 10, 9. This is Jesus. He says, yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come in and go freely and will find good pastures. We've got to put the gate back up. We've got to make the gate the main thing. Jesus is the gate. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so as we focus on our dreams and on rebuilding, and I would ask you, as I ask myself, this is what it sounds like when I preach to myself, okay? Is do you have the gate in the proper spot? Is the gate, is the gate, is, is the gate in your life Jesus Christ? Is it, in the, is it hung on, on the hinges? Is it working that you find freedom through that gate? No one comes to the Father except through the gate of Jesus. Nehemiah saw the gates and the walls were down and the once proud city of the Lord was all but destroyed. Everyone else saw no potential, but Nehemiah was fueled by God giving him a colorful dream because he knew he served a colorful God. Not everybody's going to be in favor of rebuilding. You need to get you some folks that believe in rebuilding. You need to get people who believe that restoration is possible and let them be your cheerleaders. There were enemies that tried to stand in the way of what God had breathed into Nehemiah. Their names were Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem. And that's the best I can do with Old Testament names. That's pretty good, though. That was their names. And we don't read about them doing anything miraculous. They were just naysayers and doubters. And they, didn't, they couldn't stand in front of the steamroller of God. But there will always be an enemy. There will always be an enemy that doesn't want you to repent. There will always be an, a, an enemy that doesn't want you to rebuild. And there will always be an enemy that doesn't want you to be restored. Always. He doesn't want you to fast. He doesn't want you to pray. And he absolutely does not want you to dream. And even bigger than that, he doesn't want you to dream in color. He wants your dreams to remain black and white. Are your dreams so big that they would fail without God? If not, you're not dreaming big enough. When Nehemiah's forward effort met God's wonderful plan, we see Nehemiah accomplishing amazing, miraculous effort. And here's the part that was crucial. Here's the part that was a game changer. Nehemiah, he focused on the walls and the gates. But he also focused on the wall in front of his house. It was, it was an enormous task that the wall was too great to get everybody on board with doing the, what needed to be done to do the whole thing. But God gave Nehemiah a focus and a task and, and told him, said, start in front of your house. Start in front of your house. And I tell you what, do start with the first stone. Start with the first stone. Watch what happens when, when you put a stone down and watch what happens to your neighbor and watch what's happened to your neighbor. Go read the book of Nehemiah. It's a ton of people. It's a whole page of people that they worked on the gate in front of their house. Because you know what happened? When Nehemiah started and started dreaming in color and started taking the stones in front of his house, it became contagious. But see, so many times we wait on others to help us dream. If God's got, you can't do anything about anybody else. You can't do anything about your marriage. That you, What you can do about is your part. You can bring 100% of chasing Jesus Christ into whatever situation and whatever valley you're into and watch what God brings in with it. It'll become contagious. Nehemiah wasn't focused on everybody else. Nehemiah wasn't focused on the enormity of the massive job of rebuilding this thing back. 
Nehemiah purposed in his heart that he was going to do what God had told him to do. To do what God called him to do is different than doing what everybody else was doing. If you do what God's called you to do, you're not going to look like everybody else. God told a man out there in Cottondale to walk back in front of Bojangles and to do it joyfully. And he's got a legacy. People remember and talk about that, that man long after he goes. And he did it. He's doing it for God's kingdom. It doesn't look like he has a bad day to me when I pass by there and blow, lay on my horn. There's, he, he's worn a tread out there. But you think he would, if he asked 10 people, hey, you think I ought to walk in front of Bojangles for Jesus? Even at his church, what do you think they'd tell him? They'd tell him, no, you look like an idiot. He's not concerned about the viewpoint and the validation of others. He thinks, what does God think about the dream he's given me? Am I going to be faithful in it? I'm going to tell you something that's really cool. Once it became contagious, once the first stone got laid down and everybody started getting involved in what they were doing, 52 days. They rebuilt the wall in 52 days. Now, it didn't mean that the enemy quit. It didn't mean that, that they stopped and gave up because they started putting down stones. You see... You know, before the fall, let's, let's, let's back up to before the fall. Before everything became in disarray, these chosen people were living in favor with God. They, they were God's chosen people. So there was a, a season of favor and growth. And that had been moved aside to a season of conflict. And that led to a season of apathy. And then that's where they sat, in disarray and in disrepair. To get back to a season of favor, you've got to go back through a season of conflict. To get back in a season of protection, you've got to go back through a season of conflict. It's not, people aren't just going to lay down. The enemy's not going to lay down because God's given you a dream. So what we see is we see Nehemiah rebuilding with one hand and holding a sword with the other. They're laying down stones and they're holding a sword, holding the word, holding, hold on. We're going to build and we're going to move forward. We're going to build and we're going to move forward. This is how I fight my battles. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. No more just sitting. No more just circling the past. What about this year if it was a year of the rebuild? Aren't you tired of that black and white dream? Aren't you tired of everything in your future, everything next week, next year, next month, being, being involved with the scorched earth of yesterday? Are you not tired of that? What about if we don't circle the past anymore? What about if we dream in color? Don't give up. Galatians 6, 7 through 9 says, Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You always harvest what you plant. These who live to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But, I love when there's a but in the Bible. It tells you something, something different. God's about to do something different. But those who live to please the Spirit will ha harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. Let this year, let this time, let this year before you, let this next week, this next month, let it be a year of blessing. Amen? Let it be a year of blessing. Don't give up. Let's see what happens if we start in front of our house. Let's see what happens if we start repairing the stones that have been torn down. What would happen? What would happen if we put the gate in the proper place? If I can get the worship team to come back up. If we put these stones that are under your chair. There's, everybody's got a rock or a 
a stone under your chair. And, you know, this morning, I was, I was talking to Scott about this, and is a way, you know, you may think it's hokey that you got a rock under your chair. But there's a lot of power that happens when we, when we walk in a symbolic measure of not this year. Now, I, I'm not dreaming in black and white this year. And what the enemy has tried to tear down, I am going to join with God and I am going to put this stone down in front of my house and believe it to be contagious to those in my family and those around me. And you know, this morning I, I, I bought these rocks at Lowe's. They got bags of rocks, if you didn't know. $4.58 a bag. So I had this bag of rocks and I opened them and they were really dirty and and my crew of helpers I had, we were over there cleaning the rocks. And Jason Stapp came this morning to help me to put out the rocks. And, and, and he asked me what I was doing. I said, I'm cleaning the rocks. He said, the rocks need to be dirty. The rocks need to be dirty. That's a word from the Lord. Don't try to clean up your rocks. These rocks are dirty. Don't try to clean them up yourself. You're not, that's not your job. Your job is to come to the Lord. Come to Jesus. Put Jesus to be the gate in your life. Let him be the cornerstone that you build on. And let me tell you, if you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, if he isn't the gate that you find freedom in, let that be your stone. Let that be the rock that you walk up and say, today, today, this day, I plant this rock for you, Lord. I'm not going to dream in black and white. The enemy's not going to use my past against me. Not another day. Today, this day, is the day that we put the cornerstone in place. We're going to put these walls back up, and we're going, to, we're, going to let, we're going to find freedom in Jesus. Today, this season, Lord, let the rebuild begin today. Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. When everybody else was saying something different, Joshua purposed that for he and his house, they were going to serve the Lord. Today is the day. So while, while the worship team plays, if we find a place that, that we want to grab this old dirty rock and we want to come up as individuals or families and, and say, this is the year, God, we're going to believe you for a colorful dream this year. We're going to dream in color this year. We're going to believe like Nehemiah that we're not equipped for what you've called us to. But you don't call the equip. You equip the call. We're not going to... Everything that's happened in our past doesn't uh, keep us from the dream that you've got for us. We're going to believe like Nehemiah, that he wasn't... Nobody would have voted him as the one to rebuild the city. But we're going to believe just like that. That whatever it is, if, if your marriage is torn apart, we're going to walk this rock up. We're going to believe God for it. If, if you're facing an addiction... We're going to start today. You're going to say, this rock is, is today. I'm going to put my trust in you. If you suffer from emotional problems or, or depression, anxiety, and you need God to, to start building up your walls and your joy in Jesus, walk that rock up. Lay it down. Symbolically say, I, I, I trust you. There's no plan B. God, it's you. I believe you. I believe you for restoration, for full restoration of everything that the enemy's tried to steal. The Bible tells us that he will replace everything that the locusts have eaten. If you look at what the locust goes through a field and it's, it's bare, it's barren, there's nothing there. God says, I'll give you a field full if you just trust me. Just trust me. Let's go before the Lord. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for using Nehemiah to do more than what he could ever accomplish on his own. Lord God, it, you would do and will do. You'll gather the exiles from the end of the earth, Lord God. And you'll do it not because we're good. You'll do it because you're good. Lord God, you'll, you'll restore marriages not because they're good, but because you're good. Lord, we're going we're gonna to believe you for a colorful dream this year. Lord, we thank you in advance for all the victories that we'll be proclaiming as we go. In Jesus' name, amen.